In this lecture, I will discuss fluids and their properties. In general, fluids are substances that can flow, and there are two types of substances that do that. Those are liquids and gases. When dealing with fluids, an important quantity um, that we need to know about is the mass density of a substance. The mass density of a substance is defined as the mass of that substance divided by the volume of the substance. In metric uh, units, the density, the mass density of a substance is measured in kilograms per cubic meter. If you take two different substances with the same mass, uh, you would find out that in general they would have different volumes. And those volumes would depend on the type of substance in consideration, which means that their densities will be different. As a matter of fact, the density of a substance can be used as a um, identifying property for a particular substance. When the density is measured with high accuracy, um, every substance has its own unique density value and different substances can be differentiated by their densities. In general, liquids have higher densities than gases. And this is due to the molecular structure of liquids versus gases. For liquids, the molecules of the liquid are much closer spaced from each other, which leads to more molecules per unit volume, and therefore larger mass per unit volume. For the same amount of volume for gases, the number of molecules can be anything. Uh, you can have a few molecules, you can have trillions of molecules. Even the most densest gases are not going to be as dense as a liquid. As a matter of fact, if you create a gas that is so dense, it will actually start to liquefy. And so therefore, we have much smaller mass per unit volume for gases, and therefore their um, densities are smaller. Another distinctive property between gases and liquids, as far as their densities are concerned, is that liquids are not compressible and their uh, densities are not dependent on change in temperature or change in pressure, as opposed to gases for which their densities can vary considerably with change in temperature and change in pressure. In this table, you see the values for the mass density of various substances starting with solids and then we have liquids and finally we have gases as you can see gases have the smallest density of all three types of substances another important quantity in the study of fluids is pressure pressure is simply defined as the amount of force applied over certain um, surf surface area so the pressure P is equal to the force F divided by the surface area A. And the units of pressure will be the units of force, which are newtons, divided by the units of area, which are meters squared. And an alternative unit for that, or a more common unit, is the Pascal, where one Pascal is equal to one newton per meter, uh, newton per meter squared. So in terms of pressure of a fluid, for example, the pressure of air inside a tire, the force is applied everywhere uniformly inside the tire. So the blue arrows here indicate the direction of the pressure due to the molecules of the air inside colliding with the walls of of the tire and the wheel. So the pressure is equal everywhere under normal conditions. So that means that if I look at a small cube element, this small cube right here, the forces applied to the walls of this cube element due to the gas molecules 
will be equal from all directions. There is no preferred direction where there is more force applied versus another direction where less force is applied. All directions, from the forces from all directions are equal. A similar statement can be made for an object that is submerged in liquid, for example, water. If the object maintains the same depth in the water, then the pressure that this object will experience will be constant. And as long as this object only translates parallel to the surface of the water, the pressure will remain the same. If this object starts to deep, or go deeper into the water or come up towards the surface, the pressure that the object experiences will be different, it will change. The deeper the object goes, the bigger the pressure it will experience. The closer to the surface the object comes, the smaller the pressure that the object will experience. And so you may know from your own experience that if you dive in a swimming pool and you maintain the same uh, distance from the surface, you feel a certain amount of pressure, but once you start going deeper, you would experience more pressure on your body and especially on your eardrums. So one more time, keeping the same level in liquid ensures that the pressure will be constant. Changing the level changes the pressure. The human body experiences the effect of pressure not only when it is submerged in water or another kind of liquid, but also when it's exposed to the atmosphere of the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth exerts pressure of about 20 tons on the entire surface area of the human body. That is, at sea level, equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And this is known as the pressure of one atmosphere. It is interesting to note here that this pressure is due to the entire atmosphere of the Earth. It's not only due to the atmosphere that is around the human body or <clears throat> the atmosphere that uh, is due to or within the confines of how far a person can see or anything like that. This pressure is due to the entire atmosphere of the Earth. That is actually a lot of pressure. And as you can see from this drawing here, this empty metal can was attached to a vacuum pump and the air from the inside was evacuated, leaving very few air molecules in the can. And then the can is crumpled due to the pressure of the atmosphere on the walls of the can. I mentioned before that for an object that's submerged in liquid, for example water, the deeper the object goes under the surface of the water, the larger the pressure that the object will experience. So let's see how the pressure applied to that object is determined from the depth or depends on the depth to which the object is submerged. So, for example, let's look at a container that is filled with water. And in this container, I'm going to have submerged a cage with two solid bases, the top and the bottom base, made from the same material with the same area. And the pressure that this cage will experience will be due to the forces of the water coming from all directions. So here we have pressure coming from above on the top surface, and then we have pressure coming or acting on the bottom surface from below. There's no forces acting from the sides because these um, sides here or these faces are going to be um, so thin that their physical dimensions will not be relevant for the calculation. So the free body diagram of this cage looks like shown right here. So we have force acting on the top face, force acting on the bottom face, 
and then there is a volume of water enclosed by the cage that has weight mg. So we have these three forces acting on this cage with the water inside it. So the Newton's second law says that the net force in y direction, Fy, is equal to the difference between the pressure on the bottom face, the pressure on the top face, and the weight of the water. So P2A minus P1A minus Mg is equal to zero because this element is in equilibrium. There is no vertical motion. We allow for horizontal motion if that's how it moves. We know that the pressure doesn't change when the horizontal level is maintained. So from here, I can express the force on the bottom face of this cage, P2A, as the sum of the force on the top face, P1A, and the weight of the water enclosed by this cage, Mg. I don't know what's the mass, but I can express the mass in terms of volume and density. I know the density of water. I can calculate the volume of this element here. And so then the force on the bottom face is equal to the force on the top face plus the weight of the water in between. But the volume of this element is nothing but the area of either face times the height of the element. So that is A times H. So substituting here, I get that the force on the bottom face is equal to the force on the top face plus the weight of the water enclosed in between. Finally, cancelling out the area terms, I get that the pressure on the bottom face is equal to the pressure on the top face plus this term, which corresponds to, um, which depends on the depth or the distance between the two faces. So for example, if you consider the top face of this element to be the surface of the water tank, then you can have an object that is submerged to a distance or depth h in the water, and you can calculate the pressure that this uh, uh, object will experience by taking P1 to be the atmospheric pressure, because that would be the pressure due to the atmosphere on the surface of the water, plus this term, which will depend on how deep the object was submerged. So here's an example using that formula for pressure. Points A and B are located a distance 5.5 meters beneath the surface of the water. Find the pressure at each of those two locations. So points A and B are located here and here, and there is a rock in between, so there's no way one could get directly from A to B, one has to swim over. The depth of the level where points A and B are is 5.5 meters below the surface of the water. So to find the pressure at point A and B, I need to use the formula that I discussed on the previous slide. And also, since those two points are at the same level, that means that the pressure here and here, at A and at B, will be the same. So the formula says that the pressure at inside the water is equal to the pressure on the surface, plus the term that depends on the depth in the water. So pressure P1 is the atmospheric pressure that's applied on the surface of the water. So that is 1.01 1 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Plus, then we have the density of water, 1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meters, times the gravitational acceleration, times the depth in water, 5.5 meters. That gives me a pressure of 1.55 times 10 to the fifth pascals at that depth. Notice that in this important result here, the pressure on below water is, or deeper in the water, is higher, always higher, than the pressure, you know, closer to the surface of the water. 
the two pressures are equal only when the depth is zero, when the object is basically located on the surface. Then the pressure is the same, and it's simply the atmospheric pressure. Keep in mind that there can be situations where the discussion happens for an object that is submerged in water, and both top and bottom surfaces are in the water, then this depth term here, H, corresponds to the difference in levels in the water. Only when the object is, uh, the top surface is on the surface, and the bottom surface is submerged, only then this term H here is simply the depth of submerging in the water. Pressure is measured with different types of pressure gauges. The simplest one of which is the barometer, which is used to measure atmospheric pressure. So this is a drawing of a barometer, which consists of a vessel filled with mercury and a tube that also is filled with mercury. And then it's turned over and submerged in the mercury bath here. So some of the mercury will from the tube will flow into the bath, but not all of it. And um, then equilibrium is achieved. So what is this equilibrium due to? Well, the weight of this mercury column right here should be equal to the atmospheric pressure on the surface of the bath here. So the atmospheric pressure pushes straight down. The atmospheric pressure pushes straight down and produces equilibrium with the weight of the mercury column in the tube. Above the mercury column in the tube right here, there is nothing. There is a very, very good vacuum. So, if I wanted to determine the height of this column that corresponds to one atmosphere of atmospheric pressure, I'm going to use my formula that I discussed already, for which I'm going to set P1, the pressure on top of the liquid, equal to zero, because here we have vacuum. And what I'm left with is that P2, which is the atmospheric pressure, is equal to the term that has the density of mercury, gravitational acceleration, and the height of the column. So solving for the height, so in substituting the numbers that we know, uh, results in height of 0.76 meters or 760 millimeters of mercury column. So that is the when the mercury column in such device, in such barometer, is 760 millimeters tall, then we know that the atmospheric pressure outside is one atmosphere. Another example of a pressure gauge is the open tube uh, man manometer. So this is a drawing of it. So we have a container that contains some gas. This container is connected to a tube that has an open end. And in the tube, we have some liquid, which is uh, mercury or something else. And so when the two pressures of the gas in here in the container and the atmospheric pressure are at the open end of the tube are equal, the level of the liquid will be the same on both, in both um, sides of the tube here. However, if the pressure of the gas in the container is larger than the atmospheric pressure, the liquid is going to be pushed this way, and then there will be a difference or height difference between the two levels of the liquid. So then this can be used to calculate the pressure inside the container. So the pressure inside the container will be the same as the pressure at points B or A right here. So the pressure at A will be equal to the atmospheric pressure at the open end of the tube, plus the term that depends on the density of this liquid, gravitational acceleration, and the column height right here. So if I take the difference between the pressure in the um, 
gas container and the atmospheric pressure. Then I get a value for this term that depends on the column height and that is known as gauge pressure. So when open tube manometer is used, we get a reading for the gauge pressure, which is the difference between the pressure in the container and the atmospheric pressure. This type of measurement you get when you are putting air in your car tires. So the reading of the uh, gauge that you are using for the pressure inside the tires actually gives you the gauge pressure, this value. In other words, the gauge pressure is the amount of pressure by which the pressure inside the container differs from the atmospheric pressure. So a completely flat tire will correspond to a gauge pressure of zero. And once you start putting air in the tire, this difference starts to increase until we reach, usually on average that is 36 PSI for most cars. That is the difference between the pressure in the tire and the atmospheric pressure. So far we saw that the pressure in a fluid increases with the depth in the fluid due to the weight of all that fluid above the point of interest. However, the pressure in the fluid can be also dictated by a force that's applied um, in a particular configuration of the fluid, more specifically when the fluid is confined in a container with walls that cannot be contracted or expanded. So consider a tube with thick walls that cannot expand or contract. I'm going to plug the two ends of the tube with two stoppers and I fill the tube with water. Then I'm going to apply some force F on the left stopper. So this force will generate pressure inside the fluid. So the question is, how is this pressure distributed inside the fluid? It turns out that the pressure is distributed evenly in all directions in the fluid. So the pressure, P, that generate, that's generated by this force applied to this stopper will be applied evenly in all directions inside the fluid on all surfaces that are confining the water in place. So th those are the walls of the tube and the other stopper here on the right side. Since the walls do not compress or expand, the only th the result of this application of force on the left stopper will be that the right stopper with the correct amount of force applied will pop off. This leads to some useful applications in um, technology, which I will discuss uh, shortly. But first, let's state officially the principle that uh, stands behind this effect. This is known as Pascal's principle. Uh, the Pascal's principle states that any change in the pressure applied to a completely enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to all parts of the fluid and enclosing walls. This is an extremely important principle because it allows you to determine the pressure somewhere in a fluid that's enclosed in some kind of container when you know the pressure at another point of the fluid in that container. The main applications are in machinery and technology in hyd hydraulics. So this here is a schematic of a hydraulic jack this is a device that is used to lift cars in car shops so that they can change oil or change tires or work on the undercarriage of the car. The idea here is that if you have a container in which you place some fluid, which uh, in general is some kind of oil, but you make the container so that one end is a tube with small diameter, meaning uh, plugged with a piston with small surface area. If you apply some force on that piston here, that is going to generate pressure in the fluid, which will be the same pressure at the other end of this container, which is plugged with a large area piston. 
So because the pressure here has to be the same and the area is larger, that means that larger force is generated at this large piston. So again, we have small piston with small surface area. Some force is applied to that piston. Pressure is generated in the fluid. This pressure is the same everywhere. Therefore, the pressure on the other end, where we have a large piston, will be the same as the pressure at the small piston. But because the pressure, uh, but because the area of the second piston is larger, then the force that the second piston will uh, exert or generate is larger than the original force. So we have, in a way, um, multiplication of the force due to the Pascal's principle of action and the properties of fluids, liquids more specifically. So how is that useful? Well, for example, as I said, this is a uh, model of a car jack. So here is the car. It's mounted on the large piston. A small force is applied on the small piston. Pressure is generated in the oil. The car is lifted because the large piston has more area, therefore more force is applied. So the force that was applied initially here was multiplied many times and was able to be used to rise uh, or lift the car. To describe the relationship between forces and areas, let's start with the original relationship for the pressures at two different, different levels inside a liquid. But since uh, we have the same pressure everywhere, the term that involves the height difference will be zero. And then the pressures are the same, so therefore the pressure at the large piston, F2 divided by A2, will be equal to the pressure at the small piston, F1 divided by A1. And this again is the consequence of Pascal's principle. So from here, if I knew F1, A1, and A2, I could calculate what the force F2 generated at the large piston would be by moving, um, rearranging the terms in this relationship. So to illustrate the relationship, let's look at this example. So we have a car lift for which the input piston has a radius of 0 0.012 meters. And the output plunger has a radius of 0 0.15 meters. The combined weight of the car and the plunger is 20,500 newtons. Suppose that the input piston has a negligible weight and the bottom surfaces of the piston and plunger are at the same level. What is the required input force? So we know that the relationship between the two forces is given by this formula. So substituting the known values for the weight of the car. So here there is a typo. So this should be F1, this should be F2. And the areas here should be A1 and A2. Okay, so then calculating for F1 and substituting the known values gives us that this force F1 at the small piston is only 131 newtons. So the force applied on the small piston is 130, 156 times smaller than the force generated at the large piston. So as I said, this type of device the car jack or hydraulic lift essentially acts as a multiplier of applied force. Now let's talk about Archimedes' principle. You probably have experienced a situation in which you submerge an object that is filled with air, such as uh, like a beach uh, ball underwater, and when you let go, the beach ball shoots towards the surface and, you know, most often is going to also jump above water. Well, this is due to the fact that there is a net force that pushes that ball, or in general any object filled with gas, towards the surface of the liquid. And this is due to the Archimedes principle. So we know that for an object that is submerged in some liquid, 
the pressure that is applied on the top surface, closer to the surface, is smaller than the pressure applied on the bottom surface, which is deeper under the surface of the liquid. So then that means that there is also difference in forces. The force on the top is less than the force from the bottom. So then that creates a net force that is directed towards the surface of the liquid and that net force is going to move this object towards the surface. So if I take the difference between the pressures on the bottom and top and convert those into forces, that difference gives me the net force that is applied to this object. This net force is due to the difference in pressures, as I said. Or in other words, from my formula here, this is due to the term that involves the density of the fluid, of the liquid, the gravitational acceleration, and the uh, distance between the two surfaces here. So substituting in the expression right here, I get that the net force Fb is equal to the density of the liquid times gravitational acceleration times the difference between the two faces here, top and bottom, times the surface area of the face. Noting that the surface area of the face times the height between or the distance between the two faces is the volume gives me the uh, following expression for this net force. So density times volume times gravitational acceleration. But we know that the product of density and volume is just equal to the mass. So this mass term here corresponds to the mass of liquid displaced by this object that was submerged in the liquid. So when we submerge this object in the liquid, this object obviously has some volume, and this volume will take the place of the volume of liquid that was there. So some volume of the liquid will be displaced. This term here corresponds to the mass of this volume of liquid that was displaced by the submerged object. So now I'm ready to state Archimedes' principle. Any fluid applies a buoyant force to an object that is partially or completely immersed in it. The magnitude of the buoyant force equals the weight of the fluid that the object displaces. So the net force Fb that I discussed on the previous slide is the buoyant force. And this buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that was displaced by the submerged object where the weight of the fluid can be calculated as the product of the density of the fluid times the volume of the submerged object or the volume of the part of the object that is submerged times gravitational acceleration. So when you have an object completely submerged in water, let's say, it's going to be under the action of a buoyant force that will send it towards the surface of the water. If the object is now floating on the surface, that means that the weight of the object and the buoyant force are equal to each other. So in this drawing right here, you see that this cube or block with weight of 100 newtons is floating on the surface like so after it was released by the person who is holding it. The weight of this block is 100 newtons. The block is now in equilibrium, that means that the buoyant force is 100 newtons in opposite direction. Let's apply Archimedes' principle to a swimming raft example. So we have a raft that is made from uh, solid square pine wood with dimensions shown in the drawing, 4 by 4 meters and the thickness is 30 centimeters. Determine whether the raft floats in water and, if so, how much of the raft is beneath the surface. So first let's determine the volume of the raft. So that would be 4 meters by 4 meters by 0.3 meters, that is 4.8 cubic meters. Now let's determine the buoyant force that acts on this raft. So that would be the density of water times the volume of the displaced water. 
times gravitational acceleration. The volume of the displaced water is simply equal to the volume of the raft. So, density of water is 1000 kilograms per cubic meter. The volume 4.8 cubic meters. Gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. The buoyant force is 47,000 newtons. In order to determine if the raft is going to be floating or not, we must find out what's the weight of the raft. So the weight of the raft is just the mass of the raft times gravitational acceleration. The mass of the raft is the density of pine times the volume of the raft. And so for the weight of the raft, we get 26,000 newtons. That is less than the buoyant force, which was 47,000 newtons, which means that this raft floats. So since the raft floats, that means that the weight of the portion of the raft that's submerged will be balanced by buoyant force. So what is that? That is 26,000 newtons is the weight of the raft. On the other hand, that is equal to the density of water times the volume of the submerged raft times gravitational acceleration. So 26,000 newtons is equal to the density of water times the two dimensions of the raft that we know, four by four meters times the height or of the submerged portion of the raft times 9.8 meters per second squared. Solving for H here gives me 0.17 meters. So 17 centimeters of the raft are underwater. Now let's talk about the motion of fluids. So when we talk about the flow of fluids, we can talk about steady flow. That is the state in which the velocity of the fluid particles at any point is constant as time passes. So the particles neither speed up nor slow down. We have unsteady flow, which exists whenever the velocity of the fluid particles at, at the point changes as time passes. And we have turbulent flow. This is an extreme kind of unsteady flow in which the velocity of the fluid particles at a point change erratically in both magnitude and direction. Fluid flow can be compressible or incompressible. For most liquids, the flow is always incompressible, while for gases, the flow can be compressible or incompressible since gases can be compressed. Fluid flow also can be viscous or non-viscous. When the flow is viscous, the fluid doesn't really flow readily. Imagine honey. Honey is very thick and doesn't flow very easy. Another example of an object or a substance that flows and it's extremely viscous is glass. So we know that glass is solid, but over time glass actually flows. For example, uh, medieval churches that were made with these stained windows, they measured the thickness of the windows at the top and bottom. And it turns out that the top thickness is much smaller than the bottom thickness, which means that the glass has flown over you know, the centuries downward due to gravity. Non-viscous flow is for liquids that are not dense at all and they flow very easy. And then finally, an incompressible, non-viscous fluid is called ideal fluid. So for most of our intents and purposes, we are going to consider the fluids that we are dealing with um, to be ideal fluids. When the flow of a fluid is steady, you could think of the flow of the entire fluid being made from um, streamlines on which or along which the particles of the fluid are moving. So for example, something like this. This is one streamline in the fluid where the particles are moving like so and their velocities change in direction. But let's say this is a steady flow, so the magnitudes remain the same. And so I can draw many lines here in the fluid to indicate all the streamlines, meaning all the particles that flow in the fluid, in that section of the fluid. So streamlines are useful to 
um, be able to draw uh, the direction of flow of the fluid and visualize in general how the how the flow uh, goes. So consider water flowing through a garden hose. The um, mass of water per second that flows through the hose is called mass flow rate. The mass flow rate anywhere inside the hose is constant. This is the statement of the equation of continuity. So let's look at that. The equation of continuity follows from Bernoulli's principle. I'm sorry, from Pascal's principle. Remember, in a tube with incompressible walls, the pressure inside is constant. So for a garden hose, which does not have structural um, compromises, the walls are incompressible. So therefore, the pressure inside will be the same. So for a standard garden hose, the cross-section area everywhere inside the hose is the same. So therefore, the same amount of water will flow with the same speed anywhere in the hose. However, let's look at a different case where we have a hose or a pipe system, it doesn't matter, with incompressible walls that has two different cross sections and water is flowing through that um, hose or pipe system. So the wider section has surface uh, cross-sectional area of A2, the narrow section has um, cross-section area A1. So I'm going to have a small mass delta M of water pass through the large section of um, the pipe. So this amount of mass delta M is equal to the density of water times the volume of this small section. And the volume is nothing more than the cross-section area times the speed of the flow of water in that section times the amount of time that is going to take for this element to travel that distance here. So then, in general, I can make the ratio of the mass to the amount of time that's necessary to pass through the section. And that ratio becomes delta M divided by delta T is equal to rho times A times V. So for the large section, the ratio is delta M2 divided by delta T. That is equal to rho 2 times A2 times V2. For the narrow section, delta M1 divided by delta T is equal to rho 1 times A1 times V1. So this quantity, the mass divided by time, right here, is known as mass flow rate. And therefore, I, uh, I wrote the mass flow rate for the wide section of the pipe and for the narrow section of the pipe. So here and here. But remember, this is the same mass element just flowing through two different sections of the pipe with different cross sections. We know that the Pascal's principle um, applies here. Therefore, the pressure everywhere is the same. That means that in the wider cross section, the flow will happen with smaller speed, and in the narrow cross section, the flow will happen with larger speed. Otherwise, the pressure will not be equal here and here for the same amount of mass of water that's passing through those two cross sections. So that means that the mass flow rate in each section is constant, and the two mass flow rates are equal to each other. And this is the basics, or this is the, the definition of the equation of continuity. The mass flow rate has the same value at every position along the tube that has a single entry and a single exit for fluid flow. So the density of the liquid in the, in the 
narrow section times the cross section area of the narrow section times the speed of flow in the narrow section must be equal to the density of the liquid in the wide section times the cross section area in the wide section times the velocity of the liquid in the wide section. The mass flow rate is measured in kilograms per second. For incompressible fluid, which again is any liquid, the density remains the same. The density values are the same, so they can cancel out. And what we end up with is this relationship. The cross-section area in the narrow section times the speed of flow in the narrow section must be equal to the cross-section area of the wide section times the speed of flow in the wide section. The product of cross-section area and the speed of flow is known as volume flow rate. So let's look at this example. We have a garden hose. It has an unobstructed opening with cross-sectional area of 2.85 times 10 to the negative fourth meter squared. It fills a bucket with volume of 8 times 10 to the negative 3 cubic meters in 30 seconds. Find the speed of the water that leaves the hose through unobstructed opening and obstructing, obstructed opening with half as much area. So since the water is an un, um, incompressible fluid, I'm going to use the volume flow rate formula. So Q is equal to A times V. I want to calculate the speed of the flow of water when the opening is uh, unobstructed. So the speed is equal to the volume flow rate divided by the cross-section area. So that is 8 times 10 to negative 3 cubic meters divided by 30 seconds divided by 2.85 times 10 to negative 4 meters squared. That gives me 0 0.936 meters per second. I also know that the mass flow rate is constant from the equation of continuity, so I can say that the volume flow rate is equal for unobstructed opening and for obstructed opening. So from this relationship, I can solve for the speed when the opening is half blocked. And when you substitute the numbers, I get 1.87 meters per second. Notice from the two results here that when the area is reduced in half, A2, the speed is increased twice. That's the only possible way to maintain the flow rate constant. Now we are ready to discuss the relationship between speed, pressure and elevation in an incompressible and non-viscous fluid in the state of steady flow. That relationship is given by Bernoulli's equation. Before we talk about the equation, let's uh, consider a few uh, important um, properties of a fluid that flows in a closed pipe system. So here we have a closed pipe system with wide section and the narrow section. We already saw that in the wide section, the fluid travels with smaller velocity, in the narrow section with bigger velocity, which means that the fluid is accelerating as it gets from the wide section into the narrow section. Measuring the pressure in the wide section and narrow section shows that in the narrow section, the pressure is lower. This actually makes sense because in order for the fluid to accelerate from the wide section to the narrow section, that might means that there must be an imbalanced force acting on the fluid. But that also means that the pressure in the wide section must be higher than the pressure in the low section, which then creates this net force, this imbalanced force that pushes the fluid to towards the narrow section in this case. 
If the positions of the two sections were reversed, then we would observe the same result, except for the fluid will be flowing naturally to the left. The second observation is that for a pipe that has the same cross-section area, but has two different levels, like shown here, the pressure at the lower level is higher than the pressure at the higher level. And this is consistent with the discussion about static fluids, where I talked about difference in pressures in a cage submerged in some liquid on the two faces, top and bottom of that cage. This situation. So here we know that the pressure on the top surface is less than the pressure on the bottom surface. So if the cross-section area of the pipe is kept constant, then the pressure at the high level is lower than the pressure at the low level, which means that there will be a flow of liquid towards the high level of the pipe. To derive Bernoulli's equation, I will use the principle of conservation of energy. Since there is difference in pressure here and here, that means that there must be some force that is acting between the molecules of the fluid for this pressure to occur. And that is a force that is due to the collision of molecules with each other. These forces are non-conservative forces. And those forces are responsible for the pressure difference in the fluid. So let's look at the work done by those non-conservative forces. So we know from conservation of energy that the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the total mechanical energy for a system. So here the system is the liquid, and I'm going to look at the liquid at the lower section and the high section. So in the high section, the total mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy of the fluid, the particles of the fluid as they're moving to the right in this, in this case, plus the gravitational potential energy due to the distance above the selected zero level. From that, I will subtract the mechanical energy of the fluid or liquid at the lower section of the pipe. So that is one half mv2 squared plus mg y2, that is the height above the zero, selected zero level. So the difference of those two values of the total mechanical energy is equal to the work done by the non-conservative forces. Again, those are the intramolecular forces between the molecules of the fluid. Now let's look at the work done by the non-conservative force. So the net force that acts on a element of the fluid is directed up the pipe like so, and it's equal to the difference between the force that is acting against the fluid element from all the fluid that's above, um, combined with the force that acts on the fluid element from all the fluid below. Remember, this is at higher pressure than that. So this element here is under the action of the difference, and that is this force delta F. So the work done by non-conservative forces is the net force times displacement. The net force is equal to de delta F, the difference in forces between the bottom and the top side of this element. S is the displacement, this distance that the element is going to travel under the action of this net force delta F. But then I can express the force as the product of the change in pressure and the surface area of the element. And accounting for the fact that the surface area times the distance traveled or the length of this column is the volume of this element, I end up with the relationship between the work of non-conservative forces and change in pressure, which looks like so. The work done by non-conservative forces is equal to difference in pressure or pressure difference times the volume of the element here. And already, uh, I already show you, showed you that 
the work done by the non-conservative forces is equal to this expression using conservation of mechanical energy. So that means that this result and this result are equal to each other. So let's set them equal to each other and let's see what we get. So when we set the two results equal to each other, I don't know the mass of the um, element of liquid in the pipe, but I know that the uh, equation of continuity applies, so I can replace... Um, uh, I know that the density is the same everywhere because it's a non-compressible liquid, so if I divide by the volume on both sides, instead of masses here, 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 and here, I'm going to get densities, and the density is constant since, again, this is a non-compressible liquid. So dividing, dividing by the volume, I get that the pressure difference is equal to the difference in those terms where now I have, again, the densities instead of the masses. So now I can rearrange the terms so that all terms with the same index, one, are on one side of the equation, and all terms with the other index, two, are on the opposite side of the equation. And that final result is Bernoulli's equation. So Bernoulli's equation states that in a steady flow of a non-viscous incompressible fluid, the pressure, the fluid speed, and the elevation at two points are related by this relationship. So at the high end of the pipe, we have the pressure, the speed, and the height above what we consider to be the zero reference level, all of these terms added together, is equal to, at the lower end, the pressure plus the term that depends on the speed of the fluid there, plus the term that depends on the height above the reference level. So these are equal. Let's look at the following example for application of Bernoulli's equation. The tank shown below is open to the atmosphere at the top. Find the expression for the speed of the liquid leaving the pipe at the bottom. So in terms of the considerations so far where we had a low level and high level with two different cross sections, the top of the tank is the low level and the bottom here is the high level. And you can see that here the water is going to flow very slow. Here the water is going to flow very quickly. We also see that the top of the tank is open to the atmosphere. So the pressure at this point here will be the atmospheric pressure. But also the bottom is open to the atmosphere. So therefore the, atm the pressure here will also be the atmospheric pressure. And so I write down the Bernoulli's equation for both points 1 and 2 with the appropriate indices. So P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho G11 is equal to P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho GY2. As I said, the pressures at top and bottom, P2, this one, and P1, which is this one, are the same as the atmospheric pressure, so this will cancel out. And then if I take the difference in the terms that contain the y, the distance from ground, that's going to give me the height between the level of water in the tank and the spout here where the water is coming out. One more thing, since this tank is really wide right here, the water level here drops down very slowly compared to how fast the water is coming out of the spout here. So that means that I can approximate the speed of flow here, the speed with which the liquid is going down, to be approximately zero, which then will eliminate this term right here. And so then what's left is one half rho V1 squared will be equal to rho GH, where again H is the difference in levels between the, the water in the tank and um, where the spout is. So I can solve for V1 from here and I, that is my formula.
that can calculate the speed with which the water is leaving the tank. So square root of 2 times gh. As you can see, this speed is only dependent on the difference in levels, nothing else. So if you know this difference, you can just use this formula for that type of a problem to calculate the result. Now let's look at uh, some properties of viscous flow. So for a ideal fluid, we know that the flow is non-viscous. So that means that if you break down the fluid into layers like this, these concentric circles, um, there is no drag between the layers. And so all layers flow with the same uh, velocity. However, if you consider a viscous fluid, for example, honey, then you would find out that you would observe layering in the flow. So the flow, the layer that is at the center of the fluid, and let's say that the cross section is circular like that. So the layer that is closest to the center of uh, the circular cross section will have the largest speed of flow. And then as you go up, in the layers closer to the walls of the tube in which this uh, fluid is flowing, you would see that the speed of flow will be decreasing. And when you get to the last layer, it will basically not be moving at all because of the drag it experiences with the walls of the container. So then a question can be asked, how can the force necessary to move a layer of viscous fluid with a constant velocity be calculated. So for the purpose of, you know, getting the equation out, let's look at the following configuration. So we have a viscous fluid that is trapped between a stationary plate and another plate that can be moved by applying a tangential force F. This plate here that moves has a cross-section area A. So since this is a viscous fluid, once this force is applied, that is going to essentially separate the fluid into layers like so, where the bottom layer, which is in contact with the bottom plate, will not be moving. The top layer, which is in contact with the top plate, will not be moving. This is because of drag forces. And then the other layers here will be moving with different velocities depending on um, how far they are from the bottom plate. However, if the force is applied correctly here, the right amount of force, so the layers should be moving with the same velocity. So how do we calculate this force? Now the force is calculated as the product of this coefficient of viscosity, eta, the cross-section area or the surface area of the top plate, the speed of flow divided by the vertical distance between the bottom plate and the top layer. The coefficient of viscosity can be calculated from here and that is eta is equal to F times Y divided by A times V. And the units for this coefficient for viscosity are Pascals times seconds and another common unit is the poise, where one poise is equal to 0.1 pascals seconds. Viscous flow can occur in various applications or situations, for example, oil moving through a pipeline or liquid being forced through a needle of a hypodermic syringe. Blood flow is also viscous flow. And so, uh, the volume flow rate, Q, when viscous flow is considered, is calculated by Poiseuille's law. So for the flow to happen, we must have a difference in pressure between two sections of a tube or a pipe where the uh, viscous fluid is flowing. 
So the volume flow rate is proportional to the difference in pressure. Then the volume flow rate will be inversely proportional to the length of the tubing or the pipe. When the longer the pipe, the bigger the resistance to the flow and the shorter the pipe, the smaller the resistance to the flow. So the volume flow rate is inversely proportional to the length of the tubing. Obviously the volume flow rate will be inversely proportional to the viscosity coefficient. The larger the coefficient, the smaller the volume flow rate, the smaller the coefficient, the larger the flow rate. Thick liquids have smaller flow rate, Thin, thinner liquids have larger flow rate. And finally, the flow rate depends also on the cross-section um, area of the pipe encoded through the radius. What is interesting here is that the dependence is as r to the fourth power. And this is due to the fact that we are dealing with viscous flow. And so, the flow rate is determined by Poiseuille's law, which is shown right here. The flow rate is proportional to the radius of the tube through which this fluid flows to the fourth power. It's proportional to the pressure difference between two points in the tube. It's inversely proportional to the coefficient of viscosity and it's inversely proportional to the length of the tube. Let's look at this example of application of Poiseuille's law. A syringe is filled with a solution whose viscosity is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 pascal seconds. The internal radius of the needle is 4 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. The gauge pressure in the vein is 1900 pascals. What force must be applied to the plunger so that 1 times 10 to the negative 6 cubic meters of fluid can be injected in three seconds. So here I need to calculate the pressure difference between points one and two. So rewriting Poiseuille's law, the pressure difference P2 minus P1 is equal to that expression where I know everything. So I plug in the numbers and that gives me the difference in pressures is 1200 pascals. Noting that the pressure P1 in the vein is 1900 pascals, uh, allows me to calculate the pressure P2 at the plunger, that is 3100 pascals. So then the force that's applied on the plunger is the pressure times the area of the plunger itself, so that is 3100 pascals times 8 times 10 to negative 5 square meters, that is 0.25 newtons. And this concludes the lecture on fluids.